The LA Kings don't play hockey, and they don't let the other team play hockey either. This quote from Vancouver's Nikita Zadorov after the Canucks lost to the Kings 3-2 a couple of nights ago has been the talk of the league the past few days. And to be fair, this opinion about the Kings' style of play seems like it's held by other guys in the league as well. Like Dreisaitl saying a piece of him dies every time he has to dump the puck in against the Kings. Even Drew Doughty, who's at the center of this play style for the Kings, had this to say. I mean, you know, originally when we brought the system in however many years ago, I wasn't uh, too keen on playing it, to be honest with you. But this is clearly something that has worked for the Kings, as they comfortably sit in a playoff spot despite having no point-per-game players or 30-goal scorers. So what's the problem with this 1-3-1 system that the Kings play? I mean, is there even a problem, or has all of this been blown way out of proportion? Well, for starters, this isn't the first time this 1-3-1 system has been under fire in the NHL. You see the one player up, that's all three across. Philadelphia's prepared, they're taking their time. Yeah, look at this. I mean, they're just going to stay back there. And look at, look at this. Rear just said to St. Louis, you better go forecheck him because we're not going to move. Bring a shield, really, for the first time. In this situation for Chris Barger is when pucks are really in tight around your feet. That will be the, the toughest challenge. And here again, we're in that same setup we saw a little bit earlier. This standoff between the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Philadelphia Flyers lasted almost three minutes of game time in the first period of the game. And you might be asking yourself, why? The game's just started and it's still tied, so why is neither team trying to attack? Well, the 2011 Lightning were notorious for running this passive 1-3-1 formation where the main goal was to suffocate the neutral zone by having one of the two defensemen on the ice join two of the forwards to create this wall that spanned the width of the ice. Tampa also used their F1 to guide the play to one side of the ice or the other and to block any passes up the middle of the ice. So when the opposing team commits to one of the sides, the second wave of players converge onto the puck carrier, leaving him with no choice but to dump the puck in. Where the last man back would typically be able to gather the puck with the help of his goalie and allow for a breakout the other way. That's really the core of what makes a 1-3-1 formation successful, but it also makes things a little bit tough to watch. It's a slow and suffocating style of play that doesn't necessarily represent the inherently fast and exciting nature of hockey very well, which is why Chris Pronger wasn't a big fan of this strategy and decided to make a mockery of it by just skating around with the puck in his own end and forcing Tampa to make the first move. But regardless of how painful this might be to watch, this system was effective. The year prior to implementing the 1-3-1, the Lightning missed the playoffs completely. But after head coach Guy Boucher was brought in the following year, the Lightning made it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals, thanks in large part to their newfound style of play. And the Kings this season seem to have perfected this strategy as well. All of these clips are from the game between the Canucks and the Kings earlier this week. As the Canucks gain control of this puck with both teams changing, the Kings quickly arrange into their 1-3-1 to clog up the neutral zone. And as soon as Susie commits to one side of the ice, the receiving player is met with immediate pressure, resulting in a change of possession. And again, during another line change situation, the Canucks this time opt to come in with speed by handing off to one of their best puck carriers in JT Miller. But the F1 for the Kings does his job perfectly, as he essentially cuts the ice in half and forces Miller to take the puck to the left side of the ice. And as soon as Miller commits to that side, the second wave of players converge onto Miller, forcing him to dump the puck in. This once again results in an easy change of possession for the Kings, as the lone defenseman that's hanging back is able to take this puck and make a play without dealing with much pressure from the Canuck four-checkers. Their use of the F1 to direct traffic is extremely impressive throughout this game, as once again, Number 22 on the Kings is able to close the angle on Tyler Myers and give him nothing, forcing him to make a difficult cross-ice pass to Brock Besser, who's met with immediate pressure by the second wave. This eventually results in Dubois taking the puck the other way and making a perfect pass to Fiala for this beautiful goal. I watched this game in its entirety, and there were probably about 10 instances where the Kings were fully set up in their 1-3-1 formation. And the Canucks tried every way to break this formation. They tried to let the puck carrier dump the puck in. They tried the long breakout pass. They tried to come in with speed and make a late pass to a streaking winger. They even tried to do the old Sedin play by slapping the puck all the way down from their end of the ice. 
but every single attempt was thwarted by this Kings team, which is a testament to how well this year's team plays this system, because the 1-3-1 is by no means impenetrable, especially if you're able to attack the space between the three guys clogging up the neutral zone with speed. On this play between the same Kings team and the Oilers in Game 4 of the playoffs last year, Ekholm dishes the puck to a streaking Connor McDavid, who's able to single-handedly dismantle the 1-3-1 by attacking the available space using his speed. This creates a high-danger opportunity for Evander Kane who makes no mistake and ties the game for the Oilers. This is the drawback of running a system like this. If your neutral zone defenders get beat with speed, the last man back may as well be a sitting duck as he's all alone on an island. And remember the 2011 Lightning we talked about earlier? They lost to the Boston Bruins in the Eastern Conference Finals to a very similar goal as well. Where Andrew Ference would find a streaking David Krejci through the middle of the ice, who finds a hole between the neutral zone defenders and attacks it with speed. This results in a two-on-one for the Bruins from the face-off dots in, which they make no mistake in capitalizing on. This was the only goal scored in this Game 7, eventually resulting in the Lightning being eliminated from the playoffs. And then for whatever reason the Stanley Cup Finals were cancelled that year, but to be fair to the Kings, they aren't much like the Lightning from 2011 at all, or even the trap-era New Jersey Devils for that matter. If you look at their stats at even strength, and compare it to a team like the Vancouver Canucks, who most fans would consider to be an exciting team this season, they're really not all that different. Everything from shots for and shots against per game, to high-danger chances, to expected goals. There isn't much that separates these two teams that have drastically different reputations in terms of how exciting they're perceived to be this season. And a lot of that is because, well, the Kings don't really run the 1-3-1 all game long. It's a very situational strategy that only gets implemented in very particular circumstances. And that's when the opposing team has complete control of the puck in their own end. And this usually only happens during line changes. If there's ever a contested puck in the opposing team zone, the Kings aren't falling back and hunkering down into the 1-3-1, but instead attack to retrieve the puck like every other team in the league. So I do think this whole situation is a little bit overblown. Yes, the Kings implement the 1-3-1 more than most other teams in the league, but they aren't the only team by any means. They're just the most effective at implementing it, thanks to the way their team is built. While they do have some firepower on their roster with guys like Fiala, Kempe, and Byfield in their top six, their best players are elite two-way players like Doughty and Kopitar, and even Philip Deneau, who I think is way more effective than most people give him credit for. So I personally have no problem with the Kings playing the way that they do. They're playing to their strengths, and they have every right to do that. But what does scare me is that the NHL is and always will be a copycat league, where GMs and coaches of every other team that didn't win the cup in a given year seem to want to mimic what worked best for the cup-winning team. And we've seen that happen before, with the rise of the dead puck era in the late 90s, thanks to the Devils and their neutral zone trap. And even the rise of much lower scoring games after the defense first Kings won two cups in three years in the early 2010s. At the end of the day, the NHL is in the entertainment business first, and the competition business second. So I do think that higher scoring and higher tempo games are better for the league and its fans. But that's a problem for the future. As of now, Scoring is the highest it's been since the early 90s, so I don't think we have much to worry about just yet. What do you think about this whole situation? Is the 131 really not real hockey? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.